Can I put the water on the piano? Is that dangerous? No, I'll put it on the floor. I have to begin with an apology. You know, I love this pr presentation just before me. I took a few notes. It's always important to, to build links to other people, but you bring a psychologist into your presence, it's dangerous. So I apologize immediately. Uh, the way to think of it is I was a little boy, three years old, in my father's store in Saint-Jean, Quebec, after they came from Russia, and I watched him sell. I understand the realities of selling. But I ended up a psychology professor. So it's a different view. I stand outside and think. Okay? So that's the performance I do today. I do a certain kind of performance, a kind of counterpoint performance to what we just saw. I take away certain key words from the presentation that I just saw, and I, I love the visuals. I no longer have PowerPoint in my life. After 44 years as a professor, I am free of the prison of PowerPoint. My students, my students, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Am I, not am I not speaking for the people? My students can watch the PowerPoint in their bedrooms on their own free time. I give them a concept map so we can see the faces instead of being busy writing down the Geschichte. Are we cool? Now, so these are the words that I take from the presentation before. I use it as a way to come into my presentation. I will try to be efficient. At the end, at the end, if the machine is kind and I touch the space bar and the space bar is my friend, then I will show you a bit of a visual done on an iPhone 3 by Yuval Avital, an Israeli composer living in Milan with whom I work closely. Okay, good. So the words I take from the presentation we just saw, which was wonderful. I love the kid, huh? The kid should control the world. And maybe Mr. Trump. Shh, I didn't say it. I, I apologize even for mentioning it. We live in fear. Instant feedback, engaged, compelling stories, learn from the consumer, and she liked the feel of the paper. When I went back to the University of Michigan where I studied as an undergraduate, even though I'm Canadian, and after 36 years, my roommate says, Kupchuk, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to the graduate library to smell the paper. I bring the romance. And I bring the romance of a, a Canadian uh, versed in German romanticism for whom Sheila, a refugee here in Mannheim, and Goethe are my heroes. So if you imagine where is Kupchuk coming from, I'm coming from German romanticism. In the questions that I ask, where our identity is a product of our struggles in life. I'm not so much the anti-salesman, I'm the son of the clothing store salesman but I try to get into the mind of the consumer. That's my story. So I apologize in advance if I'm not practical enough, but I ask basic questions that we should ask ourselves and maybe our children also. First, I put cards on the table. The brain is changing. The brain is changing. Our brains have been changing over the past 150 years in relationship to social changes. What's the change? The move from analog to digital consciousness. It's not just a smartphone issue. It's a fundamental issue in how our brains work. Analog consciousness, closer to the gestalt. We are in harmony, synchrony with our environment. The blood flows through our body. The chemicals unfold in our body in relation to the world around us. Digital consciousness, bits and bytes. Continuity is a challenge. We can focus in on detail, but may lose a sense for the whole as we go for the little pieces. In a sense, this shift from chemical grains to pixels is profound. It goes beyond the narrative of sales. With the appearance of the internet, my friend Peter Forderer's specialization, in an everywhere now world, the distal qualities of sight and sound are replacing the proximal qualities of taste, touch, and smell. It's an issue of detachment. 
What's the future, therefore, of intimacy and the self? And I ask this in the context of where photography is going. And I do it with politeness and I do it with love, but there are issues. I don't live on Facebook. I apologize. We have professors who live on Facebook. They show every corner of their family life to their students. Where is their privacy? This is a lecture about public and private self. So changing society. In the mid-19th century, with the industrialization in Europe, we had to come to terms with this issue of discontinuity and fragmentation in modern life. Now, there are two different views. You can have a positive view. And when I show the Yuval piece at the end, it's the positive use of technology to come close to life. So this is not, at the end of this, we all start to cry. Kupchik is sending us to, to purgatory because we're taking selfies. But close. I raise the issue. A positive view. In the age of discontinuity, expressing the romance of modernism, Baudelaire exhorted the painter, isolated in modern life, to look for the transitory, the fugitive, the contingent. Is this not what Impressionist painting was? A little moment of light captured in our experience, the transient, the impression a kind of romantic seer, an impression of life. On the other hand, the sociologist Thorsten Veblen wrote about conspicuous consumption at the end of the 19th century as an attempt to externalize and receive validation for social position. This is who I am. Look at how I dress. Look at the, look at the coach that I have. And this is not a Kupchik with the big critique of the bourgeoisie. This is looking at life as changing. In a sense, Veblen anticipated the 21st century age of digital discontinuity and digital consciousness. I will try to show it. Because conspicuous consumption has turned into conspicuous display in an era where the boundary between the public and private self has become porous. I'll give you an example in my life, two seconds. I have a book that came out, I would like to show you something at the end, but technically we may not be able to do it, that just came out, you can come to my website, look up Gerald Kupchik, nine free lectures. The book costs money, the lectures are free. I give a copy of the preliminary version of the book to someone I met from the Philippines, a sex therapist no less. It didn't take half an hour for the inscription that I wrote, it was a personal gesture to her to appear on her Facebook page. I was shocked. There's no more private gesture. At least I didn't write anything appropriate for a sex therapist. That would have been very dangerous. Now look, in the mid-21st century, before there were personal computers, in my childhood at the University of Michigan, I looked at the Wang calculator with its little yellow, its little blue numbers, and I went square root. To me, this was the miracle. The computer was the size of a giant building. We had no anticipation, or I wouldn't be here. I would own it all. Before there was the notion of the smartphone, there were critical concerns. Let me share them. And again, this is not some sort of Kupchik's here with the cynical narrative, we're all going to hell. But there are issues that it's worthy thinking about. Theodore Reisman, Lonely Crowd, 1950, the other directed personality, trying to accommodate others to gain approval. I need, to be in, I'm, I need you to say it's okay for me to have my life. Eric Fromm, in the same society, one of my friends went to the shelf and says, Kupchik, you're giving this lecture in Mannheim, you must show this. 1955, talks about the passive, the alienated consumer who does not participate actively. And this is a late motif of my talk. How active are we? How much are we participating in this world, but take snapshots, he's writing this, this is 1955, take snapshots as a significant expression of alienated visual perception of sheer consumption. All that is left are memories of what I have done. 
all that is left are memories of what I have done. I found a photo album. My parents came from Latvia and Lithuania in 1920, 1927. I have an old photo album for my mother. The paper is wilting. Pictures of Resigna from the childhood. You look at this and you feel the continuity of the family. The taxi driver who brought me to Peter's house yesterday, he traces his family till the 1600s. I was amazed. Paper memories that are real. So this love of paper at the end of the last lecture is very important. And then I run into De Boer's Society of the Spectacle. My graduate says, Kupcher, Kupcher, yeah, you don't know De Boer? I said, okay, okay. In 1967, now remember, this is you know, the, the critical theory of the Germans and the French from this era, but we don't say, uh, critical theory, yeah. What's he saying? The authentic social life is replaced by its representation. This is an issue for photography. I'm going to the heart, at least as an outsider, with apologies and caring and politeness, but what is a representation? What is the photograph? Let's slow the conversation down and ask ourselves to reflect. Look what De Boer says. Having proceeds into a state of appearing, the appearance of the image. Now my work at the university is about imagination. Do you know what happened in America? The heavy hitters in psychology talked about imagination in the early 1900s, and then the discourse switched to the image, and it was over. No more imagination. All that we have left is the image. This is a question for photography to ask. Where is the imagination in the image? Have we lost it? Identification with the spectacle supplants genuine human activity and interaction. And as he says in the end, commodity completes its colonization of social life. This is, we can say, Kupcher, Kupcher, these are words, you sound like a critical of the bourgeoisie, but this isn't stupid. Because that little kid in the wonderful little video is pushing that button on that machine and running the whole capitalist event. But it's the little machine that the kid's playing with. We can rush past it, it's cute, but we, I argue that it's necessary to slow down and reflect. So, social relations are, relationships are mediated by images. Where's the authenticity? This is Benjamin's aura concept. Where is the authenticity, where is the, the aura in the never-ending present? Because look what happens with people with all their images that we take with the smartphone. I live in it myself. Constructions of situations are actively, as actively created moments. Is there a self-conscious existence? Are we aware of ourselves? as the people who take the pictures, because are we inside or are we outside? So what are the implications of a radically changing media? Marshall McLuhan was a very gracious man, colleague at the University of T Toronto, when he said to me, and I was very young, Jerry, I don't think this method is going to give you what you want. <sighs> this can raise doubts to your core. He wrote in Understanding Media, media are an extension of ourselves, and he added that we approach the new with the psychological conditioning and the sensory responses of the old. We drag our history with us, technologically. So I take the position of this. The smart device, photography, is ethically and morally neutral. We don't have to say it's bad, we don't have to say it's good, it's just there. Within a larger, multi-dimensional media. So the point is, the little camera in my iPhone is sitting there with all kinds of other apps that have all kinds of other dimensions of life that make life easier. It's so easy to just push that button and to take the picture. It's very different from the large format camera, which makes an announcement that I'm here. You take out the big SLR or the people I used to run around Europe when I was a kid with two cameras and the big lenses. I was dying from carrying it. This is nothing. The smart device, though, is an extension of our lives and is commonplace. It's unintrusive, of course. The camera is embedded within a phone, so it's, it's just there. The question is, what is our relationship to do it? What kind of medium is it? 
And here's the issue. Is the smart device and the images that come from it a mirror of our life or a lens upon life that we can use to reflect? People send their, not so much food porn, I'm at dinner with my friends, here's a picture, here's a picture. It's just a mirror of my world. I'm going to talk about two different ways of, of relating to the world that are complementary. I begin with Veritas and the thinking eye, E-Y-E. The thinking eye makes decisions about what pictures we take and manipulate. It intentionally frames its subject. And I think about, you know, I, I talk about this talk with many different people. I'm going to do this. What do you think? So I speak to a guy who does television. And he says to me, he says, Kupchik, you know, when I see the image, it starts before the scene. I think about what happened before and what will unfold. I'm doing this in a study with Christian painting now to get people in the Orthodox and Catholic traditions looking at images. Do you see this painting? Do you see how it went before and where it will go? Are you in a relationship to the image? Veritas, thinking eye and veritas, veritas, the Latin word associated with the rational thinking eye, places a self-conscious emphasis on facts. So these smart images are there to convey, these are the facts of my life. I'm here, I'm at the wedding, this is my kid, these are the grandparents, and we want to make it easier to share the facts of our life. In a sense, it corresponds to an objective reality. Okay? But Aletheia, Aletheia, Greek concept, rehabilitated by Heidegger. The being I, capital I, brings images close to our lives or life in general. It unconsciously and spontaneously expresses meaning. We can stop there, huh? We take the picture with the smartphone. Are we thinking about the picture and planning the picture? Or is it fast? I'm here. It's spontaneous. Aletheia, related to the intuitive being eye, is oriented to uncovering meaning by peeling back the layers of the hidden. It's subjective. They're both complementary. But let me just make sure that I'm clear here. We're slowing down the process. I'm not marketing. I'm trying to be aware of myself, my students, my children, us as engaged in a world where we take images. Are these images just the facts of my world? This is the wedding, this is this, this. These are the facts of my life. Or... Do I think of this use of this neutral device as a way to comment on life? The everyday person in life, the artist in life. Now look, how deep do we go? Because as a psychology professor, as a person specializing in emotion and aesthetics, I'm concerned with the issue of how deep we go. On the surface, we organize snapshots that mirror our lives, representing, expressing the feeling of our being that we share with others. We catalog our life on the surface. There was a piece in the New York Times in the magazine section a few weeks ago, a couple months now. And it was the, the smartphone, basically smart image as a mirror of our life. And that's all he said, and the rest was how to organize it. But what is the meaning of the word mirror of our life? Are we aware of this act or are we lost inside of it? You say, I'm asking about the smart device, but what I'm really asking is about what is the nature of our life now? Faster and faster visual consciousness consumption, are we able to slow it down and think? And maybe to you guys it doesn't matter because if I'm selling it doesn't matter. My father would say when I was a kid, I remember that I was three years old, if I won't buy it, I won't sell it, put a check off in his mind. So we don't care. We want it. I got it. I got it. But I'm a psychology professor. I deal with my students. I deal with my children. I deal with myself. So I put it on the table here with love and apologies. Are we aware of this action? We know it's a fiction, but immerse ourselves in the story. That's interesting. So we're taking pictures that we're sending out to all these people, a narrative of our life, a construction of our life, 
But they're making up the story. Because this is the story we want them to see. We want them to validate our life. Is this what's happened in America? I don't comment on here. Where people have to validate your life. That you are, I'm not the coach. I'm the image of coach in this world. Look at this guy. This practice moves offline and shapes daily life. We see ourselves from the outside. We see ourselves from the outside. Because in the middle of this event, I start to take a picture, I'm outside. There's a fluidity of online and offline identity. Public and private gets confused. Because I'm not in the middle, look, I'm with my friends and I'm so busy with my friends, it's so wonderful. I stopped, I took the picture, I sent it out to people, I'm representing my life. Am I in my life if I'm busy representing my life? It's not bullshit. Real. Am I in it or am I just representing? Because isn't this how we grasp modern existence? I understand the realities of sales, but am I, where am I in my life? There becomes a functional autonomy, this is Gordon Alport's word, functional autonomy of the technology. The technology begins to live on its own. And conspicuous consumption that turns in, of the late 1800s turns into conspicuous display. Look, I'm here and I'm here and I'm here. I create a narrative of myself. How deep is it? The image becomes our mirror. Our identity becomes externalized. I'm no longer in my mind. And in my private feeling of the moment with you, I'm coaching in the picture of giving the lecture to you. Where am I? So we're reduced in that space to the image that concretizes a fractured identity. Isn't this an issue? Is the identity of the person in this digital age whole? Or is it divided up because life goes faster and faster, because it's broken down into little pieces, because we have so many different parts to ourselves, and we're representing these different parts to ourselves, and we're doing it very quickly? Can we slow down and think? Again, I apologize. This is not psychoanalysis of the photography society. But lying down on the couch and thinking about this is not a stupid idea. Smart photography splits online and offline identity, shared in private, we lose the distinction. That's the point on the surface. Losing the distinction between public and private self, because my life is continuously displayed to others. Okay. Now, yeah, and then I show a little video, and then I give your minds a nice rest. Okay. Depth. The artist following Baudelaire can treat smart photography as a lens on life. One uses the technology that I said is ethically neutral. It's not good or bad. It's like rock and roll was evil in the 1950s. Anything can be evil seen from a certain traditionalist viewpoint. There is no ethics. It's just a machine. It can do incredible things. It can preserve our lives in ways that we didn't have, and I don't have to schlep around two cameras to do it either. But standing back and commenting on life, the artist does not focus on the isolated scene that is a mirror on life. I just want to explain that again. If we see the individual snapshot in the smartphone, we lift from life a moment, put it out, and put it on a shelf. But when I speak to artists about this, they don't see the isolated frame. They see the moments before and the moments after. And they see this as an opportunity to comment. The artist does not get trapped in the frame. These images provide an occasion for aesthetic gesture. The artist reviews, and I sat down with one of my friends. In my book, there are 10 different artists who talk about their work. Then we went into their studios. We video recorded interviews with them. You can welcome to the site. It's all free. Just come. Just look. We slowly raise it. But I speak to the artists. And I talk about this talk. He says to me, Kuchik, come to my screen. So we go to his big Apple screen. All his paintings are there. And he says, you know what? With these paintings, the minute I have the paintings, my friends see it. My potential buyers see it. I understand the reality from the artist's viewpoint. So the smartphone apps 
have many different functions in people's lives. I take here the perspective of the artist. The artist reviews a whole series of images, selecting, merging, hybridizing, transforming them. We haven't talked about post-production. Because for the artist, it's not the snapshot alone. It's a whole, one of my friends does paintings of artists in their studios. He goes in. He takes 50, 100 shots. It's nothing. Bang, bang, bang. Then he goes to his studio. He goes through them all. And then he begins to work with them. I have a painting I call The Last Supper that he did. Because it looks, I, I look up on my desk, it looks like the Last Supper, except for one thing, when you get close, it's little cut out, like, you know, chuck close kind of pictures from the garbage strike in Toronto. He just took these little pieces and put them together to create the image. In other words, in the hands of the artist, the smart device is just an opportunity, like the creation of, of, of oil painting, like the moving through all the stages of oil techniques, the capturing paint that dries quickly. It's simply in that genre for them, but it has that beauty of fragmenting time, like an impressionist painter, Monet will paint haystacks, six in the morning, eight in the evening. They can do bang, 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 and then the post-production is of the essence, just like in a movie. The artist maintains a silent presence as the author of these constructions rather than a subject in the mirrored image searching for validation. I'm going to say it one more time. The artist maintains a silent presence as the author of these constructions. So these people are using the technologies and the ways to get it onto paper quickly. In the hands of the artist, they can say, oh, I see, I can take this, put it to paper, cut the paper up, put it, they see opportunity in the midst of technological change. So it's not a case of capitalism versus Kupchik's analysis. Everybody has to lie in the coach and confess we're guilty. I don't mean to represent myself in such a sinful way to life, but the freedom to choose, to realize that the frame of the moment is an opportunity. The existence and being of the artist is affirmed outside of the photograph, and then we use the internet to share, to touch, and to be affirmed. And now I'm going to show you a little video, if the machine is kind to me. One never knows. One never knows. The machine sees Kupchik coming and an opportunity for existential horror. But let me tell you about this before I show it. It's 45 seconds. You've been very kind. Kupchik spoke quickly. It's almost done. Your brains are still intact. I haven't evoked too much guilt and sin and horror, but let me tell you about what Yuval did. He's a very, very smart boy, Yuval, very, very creative. I said to him, Yuvi, I want to do a lecture where I speak and you play guitar with Kupchik. This is very serious. So when we talk to the artists, we respect what they do. He did a piece called Utopia. He went to somebody's summer residence in France, and he just had the little iPhone 3, almost a historical dinosaur that is used as the basis for this video. Utopia by, the com by this com composer, Yuval, was on vacation. Now, why should we miss an opportunity for something existential? Even the vacation. I go to my cottage so I can get into my kayak. Yuval goes to the cottage to see horror and suffering. Watch. We go to the vacation. It's very easy for you to call it up. You went to a vacation house of one of your friends. Three different couples were there. One of the couples had conflict. You didn't expect it. We've all seen it. The vacation house. He raises it as a narrative opportunity. The vacation. We have the obligation of well-being to enjoy and to relax, to share time with friends. On the other hand, you may face the fact that my father used to say, you can go anywhere, wherever you want, but you can never run away from yourself. You can never run away from yourself, you've all said to me. I said, did you speak to my father in heaven? How did you get this? Only my father knew this secret. So he writes, does utopia. Non-existing place, we strive toward it, the small break in our journey toward mortality. You can only imagine my conversation with Yuval. I cry when I get off Skype. In the purity of utopia, we bring our ghosts. So this is an important point. I'll show you the video, 45 seconds of it. It's a longer piece. The point is this. In the hands of the artist, the smartphone is not validation. 
in the hands of the artist. The smartphone is an opportunity with new technology. He says, Kovchik, if I bring a professional camera, it's so big, it's so intrusive, it's so frightening, nobody can be natural. But with the small element, the iPhone, it creates a weird agreement. And this is an interesting point. There's an agreement, and it wasn't raised. You know, we have the narrative we make, but there's an agreement in this narrative that it's okay if I walk around with a small little thing taking pictures. I'm not in your face, as they say in American basketball. It's a natural extension of the self, which is an interesting way of looking at it, where it becomes a natural extension of myself with the grandchildren and the grandparents through the mediation of technology and the print as a way of, pre pre of preserving it. So Yuval uses this camera as a kind of spy instrument to show cracks in the perfect model of the vacation. The wrong partner stressed. And this is a nice issue, the double reality in the images. Layers, and you'll see in two seconds, layers that are moving constantly. Turbulence of the summer storm to static calm. And so he brings, in conclusion, before I press the space bar with hope and prayers, he brings the two things together. The thinking eye that plans in the preparation and the execution and the post-production to try to convey meaning, and the being eye, the being eye of the artist, the, the being eye of all of us, that brings a certain intuition, a certain spontaneity, and a certain freedom in the moment to take photography away from the mechanical banality to something fresh and meaningful in our relationships with others. So we have Veritas, the facts of the episode, and Aletheia, the taking away and the editing to show hidden truth behind the vacation. And now, with respect and fear, I approach the space bar. Shh. I feel I should be almost mechanical, dramatic music. And look at the nice screen I have here. Huh? Do I have, I, space bar, oh, space bar? Huh? Do something, baby, do something. Is it going to do something? It's, it's la the screen, I'm not saying the screen is laughing at me, but I feel it. I saw the little start button. Imagine Andy, Kupchik does this big build-up, look at this video. Yes, and then, click on it. Oh, we didn't say click. Here. Ah, shh. The music comes up after. Selected clip. So Yuval Avital, A V I T A L. What's the summary and purpose of my little Geschichte here? When we reach back to the 19th century, the issue was raised about authenticity in life. Number one. Number two, when we come to the 21st century, this theme of authenticity in life turns into the issue of how we represent ourselves in life because it's so easy to avail ourselves of this technology. And the question is, you had indices of how the marketing was going in different contexts, but we can also ask the question where it would be an index of life. The speed with which we take pictures, the automatic way we take pictures and re represent ourselves to others can also, I worry, show the extent to which we're just living life automatically because we want other people to say we're okay, we're good boys and we're good girls, we're successful members of society, all I'm, my point in the end is this. We have this balance between facts and meaning, between representation of ourselves in the world in a bourgeois sense, look at the life I live, versus showing ourselves in our insight about life. And that we, I would hope as a teacher, I would hope as a professor, I would hope as a parent, I would hope that you guys in the context of the marketing and the reality of in emerging technologies try to also encourage the creativity in the user and make the user aware of options, for example, in post-production. 
for using the images to create an interpretation of life that doesn't freeze us in the moment, but liberates us to understand. That's all. Thank you very much for your patience. Now I can drink because I figured if I bend over and I knock over the water, even my mother wouldn't forgive me. Thank you, Jerry. Any, any questions? Ask me a question. It's so easy to speak and so hard to answer the questions. You could even ask him in German. He'll tell, explain it to me. I think, yes. I really like this presentation. I have one question. You referred several times to the mirror with the new technology. That's the only point I don't agree. I don't think that the new technology is used as a mirror because mirror is you mirror it to yourself. The new technology is used to open the window to, I would not say the market because you called me a sales guy. I'm a technician. Well, no, I'm, I'm a, a good boy. I'm trying to be a good and boy. But, I'm polite. I, I think... It's more that it's not only a mirror, because a mirror, it's like we heard on uh, Wednesday evening, turning uh, a moment into a memory. And what these people are doing with the technology is turning the moment into an open thing to everybody. And that's not a mirror, that's, that's broadcasting. And I think this is different to what we refer to with art, what artists are doing with Riley, to memorize something and not to turn it to, to a broadcasting. That's something oh, perfect. slightly perfect, perfect, it's perfect, more a perfect. comment than, than a question. No, no, it's very important. Remember, it's always easy to give the talk, but to handle the questions, you better have a double espresso in the morning. So when I read this thing in the New York Times, he began, it's a whole article on organizing your photos on iPhone. That's the whole, it runs page after page, but the first six or seven words was essentially the equivalent of smart is a mirror of your life. So I asked myself the same question, huh? The mirror is looking like this. It's not looking like this. I got a little, you know, semantic moment there. So, you know, I can play with it, but here in this context, I'll deal with it. But in the context of this lecture, it's mirror versus lens. It's mirror versus lens. So in a certain sense, the way I took the word mirror is... We have, you know, uh, and you see some gorgeous old mirrors in China, the polished metal, but mirror, the banal mirror that we're used to. It's in a frame, a six by nine. And we hold the mirror of life, and then we turn it around and say, look. I mean, we could, I can see a wonderful exam question. Huh, I could kill my students with this. Huh? They'd be thinking for the rest of their life. So am I capturing the frame and then turning it around and saying, look? Because there's no post-production in it. There's no the frames before and the frames after. The real, if, if, if I were, let's say, I, you know, let's say I were to come to sit down in your corporate world and we had a conversation about, okay, Kupchik, you're a weird guy from psychology, you know, you're not making us any money, but okay, we'll, have, we'll indulge you in a five-minute conversation. The conversation could be an interesting one because the question is this. When we take these snapshots, because we can take them so quickly, remember in the old days when I was in university, we'd take the picture, then we would go into the studio, into the lab, and then we would print it and the chemicals and the smell. We all remember the smell of the labs. Now it's all antiseptic. The cable may be faster, but we lose the romance of the odor. So the point is, in the old days, we felt the process. And if you read the stuff about the early photographers, there was a guy in Montreal who was very famous and people would sit for him in 1870s, 1880s, and you, you would read it. It would be an incredible story. They would come in and they, would, they couldn't move, and then we can say the metaphor, they couldn't move for minutes, and now you can move in microseconds. So this is the digital bits and bytes. The question I'm asking is this. I mean mirror in the sense of frozen moments. Frozen moments that are immediately shared. And it's, a, it's worthwhile to stop and ask ourselves the questions, what is the meaning of share? In what sense do we share? Because the Bohr and these critical thinkers in the 1960s, for them meant our life is reduced to an appearance. That's not nothing. Because look, this is Kupchik here with this, Kupchik here with that. Look who I am, look where I am. In that sense, my life becomes, in a certain sense, frozen. So mirror versus lens, and when I say lens, I mean also the early production techniques in, in photography. I mean post-production, 
being inside and outside. That's really my point. Not that I freeze a moment of my life that I share with others, this is who I am, but rather realizing that when I take the picture, I'm not in the picture, a selfie aside, huh? When I take the picture, I'm not in the picture. I'm outside. I had a friend from Ireland. He was in a private school in, in, in Dublin. It was very uncomfortable for him. And the number of people I've read about who found the camera as a vehicle of escape. He couldn't be on the football team. He couldn't do this. He didn't want to play rugby. And then he found the camera. And he came outside. And then he began to look. And all of you, I'm sure, have many, many stories of behind the camera. So what I'm really, in a certain sense, in the end, in response, I'm inviting us, even in a corporate context, to reawaken the behind the camera in the viewer, to realize that there's an opportunity not just to take the image, but to work with the image over time, to reaffirm the opportunity that we have to comment on life and not just lose ourselves inside of it. I, and, and I think it's a way of taking a look at how technology, the technology of engagement, because the different kinds of techniques that you were showing had to do with a lot of data management and speed of data management. But I think there's a relevant dimension to say data transformation. And then that makes us into all into a little bit like Yuval, who steps back and says, okay, I went on the holiday and I took this. Now I'm not on the holiday. Now I'm going back through the photo album remembering. What can I do with it to think more deeply and also relive those moments? I think there's some room there for some nice uh, corporate development in the direction of that creating, bringing back the old timer into the smartphone so we slow down the speed and increase the opportunity for reflection. Reasonable. That's why I never think in terms of right or wrong or this or that. I always think in terms of opportunity for, I watched how all these, this narrative creation. Narrative creation is a very special opportunity. What I'm talking about here is an aspect of narrative, to bring out the artist in all of us. Reasonable. Huh? It's like selling a pair of pants, huh? I was giving an, I'll even give you a tie with the pants, don't worry, and even maybe a, a, a nice extra jacket. But it's a reasonable way to look at it, I think. There's no, because there's no necessary contradiction between the concerns for, core, for transformation and technology, but really what I'm raising the issue is what is the relationship between the apparatus and the photographer? And there's room for thinking of that in the way of slowing down this rapidity and being lost in our world to regain the opportunity to comment. Because that's what the artist and writer does. Reasonable. Yes. Reasonable. Reasonable. Jerry, thank you very much. I think it's thank you for perfect, your patience. Perfect overly to take a cup of coffee and continue, and cry. Continue <laughs> slowing down. Exactly. Again, thanks so much.